Hello everyone and welcome back to the Skype Sessions. My name is David and today we have with us John Lee who is an audiobook narrator uh, and he has done so much work in general. Seriously, just check him out on Audible. The number is obscene. But he has also been doing some of Lewis's work and seemingly all of the really hard books as well. And in a couple of days after this video goes live, this book... English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama, will be coming out on Audible. And so I wanted to get him onto the show and hear a little bit about his story and what it takes to record an audiobook and what exactly it is that he hates about himself that he keeps going for these books that are just huge. John, welcome to the show. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sometimes known as John Rafterly, but that's a, a long story about the union. Oh, the many, the many unions I'm in. But... Uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, C.S. Lewis. Here's an odd thing about my relationship with C.S. Lewis is I was raised Catholic, like serious, serious Catholic. Um, but the odd thing is, um, like the screw tape letters, um, and he, he did a lot of writing about it. I never actually, we were never encouraged to read Lewis, um, even as kids. We, we were never encouraged, not that I remember, to read the Narnia Chronicles. And later on, we were never said, you should all read C.S. Lewis because he's a fine Catholic philosopher. So I never really encountered him and I did not read him as a kid. Um, and of course, the thing that people read is Narnia Chronicles. I eventually did read the Narnia Chronicles because I had a girlfriend who liked me to read the Narnia Chronicles. Narnia Chronicles to her, even though at the time I was still just a stage actor. I had not done any audiobook narration. But uh, that's when I read the Narnia Chronicles. And um, until I got offered all these, as you call them, the serious uh, C.S. Lewis books, I really, I knew the screw tape. <laughs> yeah, that's just, the, the serious books are thick. Um, I, 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 I'd never read the screw tape letters, which I have not recorded, but uh, um, and I certainly had never read his critical work. Um, and um, when I came to it, I, 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 the reason I got offered them, I suppose he's English. I'm English. Um, well, he was actually Irish. Oh, of course, he was like me. He was actually Irish. An, Im an import. <laughs> an import. As I like to point out, the number of things you wouldn't have if it wasn't for Irish immigration to England, for instance, the Beatles, mm -hmm. the Bronte sisters, uh, Elvis Costello, Spike Irish Milligan. Irish breakfast tea. <laughs> there you go. I like to think of that as Indian. And um, <laughs> okay. uh, so I, when I said yes to taking the C.S. Lewis um, 16th century, I had no idea it was, I asked somebody after I got it, I said, how many pages could you write on 16th century literature? Not excluding drama. Excluding drama. And the answer is <laughs> almost zero, but he could write 650. And it is quite, quite a tome. I studied, uh, I studied English as my degree uh, in England. And uh, uh, as the stand-up comic John, Mul John Mulaney says, I paid, uh, well, Back in the day, it was essentially free to go to college where I grew up. But uh, uh, John Mulaney says, I paid $120,000 to get a degree in a language I already spoke. <laughs> so uh, I'm one of those. Uh, um, so I came to this thing and uh, my goodness, what um, it's dense, shall we say. It ain't the Narnia Chronicles and it ain't the screw tape mm -hmm. letters. Um, so, uh, boy, I mean, you know, you're asking about prepping an audio book, as in a, a, any audio book you might get. Uh, if you're getting a, a, a piece of fiction, you need to know who the characters are, gender, where they're from. You know, this morning I was just doing a session on a detective series set in Newcastle in England, which is a very specific accent. And... Um, but so you you need to know age, and if the voice is actually described by the author, you have to match. He was growling. He was gravelly. She had a very high voice. Um, 
But when you come to non-fiction, the prep is simpler simply because there are no characters to do. But <laughs> when you get C.S. Lewis, fortunately, I, I, I actually, again, it's too long a story, but I actually did study Latin and ancient Greek. You don't want good, to good. <laughs> and um, so a lot of the st so that may be why they offer me things like uh, Lewis is because I can actually read Cyrillic script and I can pronounce Latin, though, you know, of course, people, oh, that's not how that's pronounced. And you say, you know, or W, Wenny Weedy Witchy, Wenny Weenie Witchy. Yes. Which he did not say when he arrived in Britain, by the way. But that's another story. Um, the. I'm not <laughs> he would sure have said, have... got a. Can you put the kettle on? <laughs> yeah, or, or um, what? No toilets? And um, the thing about pre prepping for Lewis is just, um, first of all, one of the things he does is he uses words that you've literally never, you might have seen them in a book before, but then you read them. I can't think of any of the words now, but I remember going, what? I have to look up what that means. That was one of the things I had to do was look up what it means because you need to, to say it as though you know what it means. <laughs> as though you understand it. <laughs> as though I understand it. And he has this, his erudition. Uh, I, boy, um, when he's describing the, the rhythm, the rhyme, the, you know, I know what an Alexandrine or Alexandrine, I don't even know how to pronounce that, rhyme is. I know what iambic pentameter, I know what a trochee and, an, and a dactyl are, but oh, there's a lot of stuff in Lewis that is really, it's fascinating, <laughs> but he, uh, boy, I, I, I did spend my time thinking, did he teach at Cambridge? Oxford, I can't uh, remember. Oxford first, and then he got he was the chair both, yeah. medieval and renaissance at yeah. uh, Cambridge, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I remember thinking, boy, he must have been an exacting tutor. You, <laughs> boy. The other thing I His, found... Which, they either loved him or hated him. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> and, I think, yeah, I and, I, yeah. and I think for that reason. Yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, I don't even know what that word means. Um, and I, I think, um, I mean, I have this thing about literature, which, which is weird if you've, like me, have been someone who studied it. You think... You know, can we not just enjoy the book? <laughs> you know? So I do find myself doing that sometimes with Lewis. But I think the thing about Lewis is he obviously really enjoyed these things because they were in 14s. And it, it, oh my God, it's just quite remarkable. Uh, I learned a great deal reading 16th century Good. literature. What was the other one I just read? It's gone out of my head completely. You read Preface to Paradise Lost. I'm actually in the middle of that at the moment. Oh, the Preface to Paradise Lost. When I was uh, when I was studying Paradise Lost, I actually studied Paradise Lost at high school, secondary school, as we call it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. I, I went to a very strange school, which is where the Greek and Latin comes in. Well, as soon as you said that, I thought, hmm, some, somebody went to a private school. <laughs> actually, yes, yes. Despite the fact that I was a poor kid, uh, uh, I was subsidized uh, uh, or scholarshiped or whatever it's called into a uh, private school for reasons that your audience will not be interested in, unless they're deeply Catholic. <laughs> well, that's actually something that we share because I was also subsidized into a, a Catholic monastery school. Oh, what was it called? Dowie Abbey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I was at this very, very low end of the years, the low end of the spectrum. But... Um, uh, uh, I do find myself thinking what he enjoyed about a book is not what I enjoy about a book. But Paradise Lost, um, it really gave me a great appreciation for the poem and how, I mean, you know, Milton, I, I, I write plays and I have the, I'm writing this play about somebody who might go to heaven and might go to hell. And somebody says, um, uh, one of the characters goes, well, hell can't be that bad. Yes, it can. Milton's there. And, <laughs> um, but um, I, I found myself absolutely fascinated by his um, attack on, not uh, approach to, not attack on, he, wasn't, he loves the poem, uh, his approach to Paradise Lost. But again, I found myself thinking, could you not just enjoy it? <laughs> 
But, but, so, but um, he does that as well. In Meditation in a Tool Shed, he talks about the two ways of consuming something. So you're in a tool shed, you see a shaft of light coming through. In it, you can see the, the dust moving around. The and this, that's one way of looking at it. But you can then go and look along the beam and you go back up out or away from the shed up into the sky and towards the sun. Oh. And so I think in 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 books like this, <laughs> we're getting we we're getting Lewis looking looking at at the sunbeam rather than looking along it. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, whatever we you know, there are certain poems whether you like them or not. Uh, the Fairy Queen, of course, which he mm-hmm. discusses at great length in uh, 16th century literature, um, <laughs> and Paradise Lost where it's a bit like um, they're a bit like tourist destinations. Like someone would just showed me a picture. They'd just been at the Trevi fountain in Rome and okay. it's like 19 people deep for all. You can't get to the Trevi fountain. I mean, I went there years ago and there weren't that many people there. You can't, you literally can't mm-hmm. get to them. And I go, ah, oh, but there's a reason people go to the Trevi fountain. It's really a spectacular piece of sculpture. So mm-hmm. Paradise Lost, Fairy Queen, Chaucer, there's a reason they they are still in print. They're, you know, and the reason some like Lewis is uh, fascinated by them, their structure, their rhythm, their rhyme, uh, uh, you know, they are remarkable works of literature, no matter how difficult they might be. Um, you know, and it's a long time since I read Paradise Lost. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Satan's a fantastic character. He's one of the great characters in literary, literary history, Satan in Paradise mm-hmm. Lost. So there's a reason that we go back to that well, as it were. You know, and I've read Chaucer. I can actually still pronounce Chaucer, I think. But some, some things stick with you. And then, mm-hmm. um, you know, the funny thing about Lewis, um, you can't do this as a narrator. You can't introduce your, your opinion, as it were, by the way you speak. <laughs> but if, if you're... Um, a deeply embittered Catholic, as I am. Um, Mm. Well, there are a couple of things about Lewis that are, um, I don't know how much this is a modern sensibility or if he faced this criticism when he wrote. It's like his, I'm not going to call it misogyny, but his attitude to women (laughs) was, you know, he, he, he actually openly refers to them as inferior in places, essentially. And that's like, hmm. And uh, L- Lewis has a slightly complicated relationship. And also you do see a very clear transition as he gets older. When, when he, particularly when he meets uh, What's-Her-Face. That's a terrible way to refer to somebody. But... <laughs> you mean Joy. his darling wife, yes. Yes, he meets yeah. Joy. But also there are, other, there are other women in his life leading up to that, like Ruth Pitter and uh, Dorothy L. Sayers. And, mm. you know, he, he had, although Shadowlands gets a lot of things wrong, there is, it still does communicate something of the all male environment that Lewis lived in for an awful lot of his life. And yes. particularly, as, particularly as he starts meeting um, women that can go toe to toe with him, uh, you do you see his female characters change and, yeah. and culminating in what my co host Andrew repeatedly refers to as Lewis's best book, and Lewis thought it was as well, Till We Have Faces, where you have mm-hmm. him writing from the point of view of an ugly woman, Orwell. And that is widely regarded as one of the best representations ever. And so you see that he had, in his life, he had gone through a certain boot camp of uh, uh, what, it, what it takes to understand a woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and he's very, um, you know, he's... It, 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 every now and again, his sort of um, ambivalence. I mean, he, he married an American, but... His ambivalence towards the United States comes out once mm-hmm. in a while, which is, you know, that's, it's, there's nothing it's, offensive. About I love, it. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm elbowing my wife. I'm like, hey, listen to this. <laughs> it's just there's also, I mean, what's really funny because we live in a time where tomorrow, you know, there'll be a new iPhone and it will launch satellites. But he's living in a time when. You know, by my parents' standards, my parents were born in the 1920s and they grew up in rural Ireland. So imagine what they saw between 1924 and, the, you know, the, the, in the 1990s, uh, the, the, the uh, 2015-ish. Uh, but at the time, Lewis, adv- technological advancements were pretty 
50 incremental. But he just, you can tell he's kind of holding himself back because he really wants to rail against things like ballpoint pens. <laughs> and, you know, well, mechanical, it would, it, the mechanical pencil. <laughs> well, it ruin, ruined his process because he was used to a dip <laughs> pen. So he'd put his pen in, sound out the words as he's doing it. And then as he's refilling, he's thinking about what he's going to write next. You're a, you get a ballpoint pen and you just keep going. It's just madness. Uh, there I, you have, go. I write with a fountain pen. <laughs> I'm somewhat with Mr. Lewis on <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, it is funny. He's such a curmudgeon. And, and I think he certainly has his moments, but as I'm yeah. now heading into my 40s, I'm noticing that I have <laughs> increased numbers of moments. I, I really Have you heard the music of the youth today? Just noise, just noise. <laughs> hey, you, know, you know, I used to go and see the Damned in concert, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with modern music. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he's, um, you know, there is that thing. Uh, there, there's that. He is, he actually, stereotypes exist in some cases, particularly about the English, because you can True. read. Yeah, well, there is a truth about that. Go on, ask me how many cups of tea I've had this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I always have a cup of tea in the afternoon. Oh, you know what I have in the fridge? A Swiss roll. And... <laughs> Um, it's, uh, that old stereotype of the English curmudgeon is, Lewis was it, you know, he, he, people are always much more complicated than they might at first appear to be, but he really does sort of quietly rail against modernity as he sees it, you know, the flush toilet or whatever it was he was against. And, uh, uh, that's kind of. I mean, while I'm narrating, I'm thinking, this is funny. There's a guy who thinks that, you know, modern, the world is moving too quickly in the 1950s. <laughs> you know, the damn Nazis. Yeah. It was, um, so it was actually very funny in that sense to, uh, to read it. I, and um, I'll talk about you. I, I'm actually, I've got another Lewis coming up, you know. I, oh, I'm rec- really? uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start recording uh, on writer. Is it writers and writing or writing and writers? I can't remember which. His advice it's to writers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, or, or on writing and, <laughs> you know, I'll know the title when I start narrating. It. <laughs> but um, I actually love writing manual books, even though I don't really pay much attention to them most of the time. But I'm going to guess, I haven't prepped it yet. I'm guessing that Lewis probably has good advice for writers, even if, if it will be very um, traditionalist, I imagine. Mm-hmm. I don't actually know what well, he I thought. Mean, Say again? Uh, well, he, I mean, even some of his works, like, for example, his very first book of poetry that came out in 19, well, it's just after the war. So just yeah. after the First World War. Uh, and he was, it, it, it was, it had a lukewarm reception and partly because he was using older poetic forms, which he loved, which he but loved, which at that time were not very in. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't Eliot and it wasn't pound or, you know, um, yeah, he liked, he liked the older forms. Yeah. I mean, you know, Hey, I was just listening to lead belly the other day. I like older forms too. That kind of intellect is, I find myself sitting back and marveling at it because I'm not that. I mean, you know, you know, being relatively bright, which most of most people I know are, is not quite the same thing as what's going on with Lewis. And you know, yeah, that's an interesting point you made about. Um, I've I've often thought this of say of governments, but particularly the English. I always call it England. Rather, I find Britain a weird concept, but that's. Oh, that's another story. Lewis, Lewis, Lewis himself says only politicians and foreigners talk about Britain. <laughs> yes, and uh, um, that the, the the ruling class in Britain now is still men who went to all boys boarding schools mm-hmm. and were forced, sadly for them probably, to go to mixed gender universities, which once upon a time were of course single gender universities but i think it's an interesting um reading lewis is a uh, is interesting in light of when you see the behavior of men who have spent their youth in single gender institutions mm. uh, having done that myself it's very in you know well my my elementary primary school if you call it was boys and girls but my 
secondary school was single gender. And it does make a difference to your outlook on life because mm -hmm. those are the years when you are being formed. And you can you can sense it in Lewis quite a lot. In the same way you can sort of, as I say, smell it off the people who run Britain. But, yeah. well, we'll when I when I moved to sixth form, so when I was when I was sixteen, that was when I moved yeah. back into coed, uh, and it was lovely. There were all these pretty things everywhere. It was, it was a whole lot. After, after having spent six years next to these filthy, horrible, smelly, oh, disgusting smelly. creatures, yeah, <laughs> oh, covered in mud. Mm. And I was at the country. Uh, well, so. that, that 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 was the, that was the best thing that they'd be covered in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm about to go into writers and writing, and I'll, I'll, I'll prep that the same way. I've, I, 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 when I dip into it, I'm sure I'll find that it's not as, you know, the. Uh, I'm guessing there's less uh, jargon's not the right word. Uh, there's less obscurantism. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Lewis is deliberately obscurantist, or it's just the way his mind worked that he thought it was okay to use words that none of us could actually interpret or we'd have to go and look up but maybe that's just well, how he that's how he spoke maybe i don't know yeah i i mean he certainly he certainly could simplifies language when needed so if you crack open mere christianity it is mm. very very readable but he knew this was going out on the radio to the british public as a whole so he's not going to yeah. begin each talk with several lines of greek or french or german or and just yeah. not translate it and assume that people yeah. are going to know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think very often it's the genre that he's writing in and his intended audience. Yeah, he's uh, adapting. And, yeah. 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 He and writes, it would, he, he writes and, it, and it would be it would be nice if he explained a little bit more for those of us who you know yeah. took Latin for three years and then begged to give it up and was told <laughs> that you could give it up if you got less than sixty five percent on the final exam and you managed to score sixty four. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> That was a happy day, uh, but like but at the same time, it mean it means lots of uh, lots of fruitful discussion for podcasts to help explain it, yes, some it, of these things he's referring to. Let's explain some of C.S. Lewis's words. Um, mm -hmm. And you asked me uh, at the beginning uh, um, about the actual process of recording. Um, yeah, I, I've heard Andy Circus drinks his golem juice golem to juice. save his throat. I, I, people have. Uh, there's one person I know who has a pharmacopoeia on a little table next to the, the chair microphone. Uh, she's uh, sipping various concoctions from various bottles and throat coaters. And I have a glass of water. Uh, the, the, what's the one trick? Oh, biting an apple <laughs> is what some people do, a sour apple, because that'll get your saliva flowing, which can help if it's not too much, anyway, too much saliva. <laughs> you get into all sorts of, you know, uh, um, physiological questions. And um, for me, the process, um, you know, as I get older, my, my sessions get shorter simply because my voice doesn't hold up. But um, the process itself, I mean, it, you know, this is a first world problem. It's actually, it's quite hard work <laughs> recording an audio. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't doubt it. I've, you know, yeah. as a podcaster and I've recorded longer things for people. It gets tiring. It gets tiring. After an, after an, after an hour, you really want a break. You have to take a, you have to take a break. You certainly ninety minutes is a long time to narrate an audio book. The, 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 the thing about an audio book that's difficult is if you're reading a book in your you know sitting on a sofa, um, you're reading a book, and you'd be surprised, I think, that how your concentration is um, fluctuates. When you read an audio book, narrate an audio book, you have to concentrate incredibly hard all the time. And that's actually, it's weird how exhausted you get using your brain. And, uh, you know, and your, your eyes get tired. I remember the first time I did an audio book because I really wanted to impress. This is a long time ago, 1999, when it was still actually on tape, books on tape. Uh, and I really wanted to get more of this work. And so, oh, I started doing, I was sitting in there. I'm not going to take a break. I'm not going to take a break. I went home with a blinding headache. Uh, my vision was slightly. Really needed to pee. Uh, well, there was that. Slightly. Uh, <laughs> I needed to do that less back then. But um, my vision was slightly blurred. I had a headache. My 
back ached because I'd held myself in a position only exactly six inches from the microphone. Uh, and I, over the years, you learn to relax. But it actually is, it's, it's very hard work. And the thing with something like Lewis, uh, in a way, you can let your, you, you can let your concentration drift a little bit. Um, if you're reading something light, perhaps, uh, you know, I'm doing this actually quite wonderful detective series, um, which I was working on this morning, and and it's it's much more fun. The problem, problem, the the difficulty with Lewis is um, how hard you have to concentrate because you have to follow his meaning, which is sometimes difficult. Um, you can be reading Latin and Greek and French. Um, and I think there was some Italian in there in mm -hmm. one of the things I did. No, oh, of course, it would have been in 16th century literature. Um, so um, Lewis is quite difficult to keep. You, you, my, my sessions with Lewis are shorter than my sessions with many writers because it's simply harder to do. Um, I actually mm. really... I'm, like I said, I haven't read uh, prepared uh, writers and writing, uh, but I really liked the 16th century literature, mostly because I have I, I was familiar with some of it, you know, uh, the Fairy Queen, Chaucer. Um, of course, most of us um, are more familiar with Shakespeare, and of course, he deals with the, the sonnets. Of course, um, it's really quite hard to do those, and they don't pay you any more. Damn. <laughs> I should write and go, this one's really hard. Can I get more money? I had to concentrate so hard. Please. Per foreign word and per word that is above <laughs> yes. a, you know, <laughs> such a grade reading level. Yes. I have to look what, uh, what that meant. I want more money for French. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it, that, that's the recording process for Lewis. Of course, you know, the, the lighter stuff, which is mostly fiction, uh, it, it, it can be sometimes is easier. So, but the, you know, I really um, I learned a great deal from reading Lewis. It was great because I didn't know those works at all except as titles, and I did not know that 16th century literature was 650 pages long. Oh. Well, you, you know, you know, he called that book the O Hell book, oh. the Oxford History of English Literature. So in his letters, he refers to it currently working on O Hell. Oh. God. I mean, how long does it take to write something like that? Goodness. I should have looked that up, but it was definitely a significant investment because by the time that he's writing that, he's already a successful, popular author. Uh, and so yeah, the, the, the dons at Oxford are starting to get a little bit sniffy yeah, yeah. about you doing all this popular the, stuff that yes. anyone can read. The pl for the play. You need to be doing some scholarship. Yeah. Make, it, make it really hard. <laughs> yeah. Damn the people. Um... <laughs> You know, it's interesting when you, I, I, I do some, um, what I call university press books, the, the history of mm -hmm. policing in England. Um, odd thing, or, 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 or um, changes, you know, between, changes in naval law between 1820 and 1942. I, I, it's like, who downloads them? And when he was writing 16th century literature... <laughs> Moving from Oh Hell to Oh Hull. <laughs> oh, Hull. Oh. <laughs> yes. I like that. Um, the, the jokes don't get better. <laughs> they, ah, I liked it. Um, I, I, I do wonder about these boys. It's like, who reads them? Who read 16th century literature, I wonder? Besides his fellow academics. I'm sure it was a course textbook, effectively, right, for right. many universities. Yes, but and also then you have Lewis nerds like myself that see it on the shelf. And, it's like I'm going to get to you someday, but I'm going to wait until somebody does an audio book <laughs> so I can be an inner child again and be reading the book and listening to it, it at seems... the same time. And think, oh, that's how you pronounce that word. <laughs> well, that's how John Lee thinks you pronounce that word. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a uh, boy. Yeah, it's uh, you just wonder about the audience. I mean, university presses are publishing things for reasons other than you know, mass market, but you know, tenure mm -hmm. and all of that. But yeah, there uh, that was a couple of tough books, Paradise Lost and Sixteenth Century. Wow, 
Uh, but I've got a. Thank you very much for doing them. <laughs> no, you know, as I like to say, I got paid. It's a terrible mess, my attitude. <laughs> but you know, there, there, there is actually when you're doing books, you do look forward to some books more than others. And weirdly enough, I was even though it was 650 pages long, I was actually looking forward and did enjoy the 16th century literature. I, I thought it was great. But you know, I'm strange, as I say. You know, I have a degree in a language I already speak. So, but yeah, um, but I do. Well, um, I've got a, what other audio book? Hmm? I was going to ask what other audio books you've got in the pipeline. I do for my sins an awful lot of fantasy and sci-fi. I've just finished uh, the fourteenth in a fantasy series called Spellmonger, and I am about to do the eighth. There's a uh, Sci-fi writers have a tendency to write in trilogies, and each part of a given trilogy will be about 900 pages long. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very long, but they do come out over many years. I'm about to do uh, a, a guy called Joel Shepard. I think he's actually Australian. He's written a series of books called The Spiral Wars. I think they're called Space Opera. I'm not really sure what the difference between Asimovian or Vonnegutian, <laughs> uh, 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 sci-fi is, and these things called space operas. I mean, if I read Slaughterhouse Five or The Sirens of Titan, I I, I, I get the difference between that and what I'm reading for um, these long space operas. Um, they're incredibly long. Um, and See, at least Lewis's were shorter. He did a trilogy as well, but they're relatively short. Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and that hideous strength. Oh yes, we're actually going to be doing Out of the Silent Planet next season. Oh my! I should inquire about that. Um, hmm. The 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 uh, these massive space operas. The, the good thing is that uh, they're so long; they take the writers a long time to get through. So, like, so you this, cop, break. this uh, book um, of Spiral Wars. So it dropped in my lap and I, and I looked at it and went, I have a very vague recollection of some of these books because it's been some years since I actually narrated the, the previous one, which probably came out six years ago. Or I don't actually know when it came out and couldn't remember the title because it's simply been so long and I've done, you know, probably several hundred books since then. Um, so I'm doing Spiral Wars. I'll be doing the Lewis Writers and Writing and this Newcastle um, detective series uh, by a guy called Roy Lewis. Uh, I'm, I've got a whole bunch of them up through spring of next year. And they're, they're really... So you'll be, you'll be fluent in Geordie by then. Oh, it's fluent in Geordie by then, man. Um, <laughs> it's... Uh, you know what's interesting about narrating audiobooks is that you do actually discover these completely, well, relatively obscure people or people who were once really popular. Um, do you know an actor called Hamish Linklater? Mm, I think so. He, he, he's relatively well known. So I start reading these books by Eric Linklater, who was from the Orkneys, the, the Scottish Islands. And I kind of work out somehow that Hamish, who's a, a friend of mine, is actually his grandson. But Eric Linklater was a very popular novelist in the earlier part of the 20th century. And uh, is a really good writer. Lovely stories and beautifully written. And is just out of fashion. And yeah. who knows why? Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're very old fashioned, but in a good way. And this guy, Roy Lewis, who's a much more I think he's probably still writing because his copyrights are in the 21st century. Um, but they're really well written. And you find these, I don't want to call them obscurities because they probably sell in significant numbers. And you go, oh, this person is actually really a good craftsperson. And so uh, you do get these um, little gems. And like this Roy Lewis series is uh, uh, really enjoyable. So you do get that those little surprises. Well, I mean, Lewis, the very similar thing could have happened to him. It was only because Walter Hooper, who was his secretary in the final few months of his life, basically championed his cause. 
that went to publishers when he found more material that was unpublished and said, I will let you have this, but you've got to bring out two of his pre-existing books. You've got to bring them back into print. Oh, And that's how this Anglican layman managed to stay in print for so long. It's because he had somebody championing his cause and keeping his books in print. And because they were still in print, they could still sell. And therefore, you know, oh. he, he remained consistently popular. But yeah. as I've more of more, the more of Lewis I've read, the more I've read what he read and what he refers to. Mm -hmm. And I, I repeatedly find gems. And it's just very often that these, these folks just didn't have an advocate like Walter Hooper. Oh, of course on Sundays, um, Back in my mostly college days, because I, I went to college in my hometown. Uh, but I used to play soccer every Sunday around the corner from Tolkien's house. Nice. So there you go. Nice. I, I was close to Tolkien. <laughs> oh, I think he was probably dead by then. <laughs> but Tolkien's probably. House. But his, gra his grave isn't too far, so you never know. Yeah. But it, uh, the Tolkien family has is um, not not far from where I grew up in Birmingham. No, no. Oh, oh, oh! So that that oh, so early Tolkien then? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't. I think the house, the house until very recently was still in the family's, was still owned by the family. I think the the, the one thing I always, uh, the Birmingham City Council was um, they wanted to turn Tolkien's house. It's in a street called Gracewell Road, and uh, they wanted to turn it into a tourist attraction, and so uh, it was put to the council, and the council said, "No, that'll be too much traffic." <laughs> So it didn't become a tourist attraction. Such, an, such an English response. It's just like, oh, the traffic yeah. will be terrible. Well, we can't traffic, allow that. The traffic will be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, we can't have that. Can't have that round our corner. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, 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 Tolkien's house did not become a, uh, a tourist attraction. But they were friends, of course, Lewis and Tolkien, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in Oxford, they. Uh, it was actually, there was, Out of the Science Planet was a result of effectively a bet because he said to Tolkien, Tollers, there aren't enough books out today that we of about the sort of thing that we like. So they to they tossed a coin, and Lewis got a space travel story, and Lewis uh, and um, Tolkien had a time travel story. And Lewis ended up producing a trilogy. Tolkien, being Tolkien, spent a lot of time working on it and then forgot about it. But it did sow the seeds for what would later become a book you might have heard of yeah. called Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> my, my neighbor Tolkien. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. well john lee thank you very much for coming on the show what this has been delightful. a delight you know talking about books is not the worst thing to do in the world and uh i i agree and i'll be and particularly if you have if you if you have a nice beverage <laughs> that your wife brought you just before it's even better <laughs> as you say it, you know it's saturday so it's close enough to five o'clock where you are you know in wisconsin it's already what it's, uh it's 12 in the morning yeah, but it, it's it's even later in England, so that's that's why I still go on. Yes, I, I was actually just back in beautiful beautiful Birmingham, which oddly enough is quite pleasant now. Just before I left England, and this was about a decade ago, they had poured so much money into oh, Birmingham. Yeah. It was delightful. Yeah. They cleaned that place up. Oh my up goodness! Beautifully. It's uh, my kid, who's like an Angelino to the core, uh, uh, actually really likes Birmingham. Well, the food's great for one thing. She's a bit of a food person, but the food in Birmingham is fantastic, and uh, it, it's uh, yeah. I actually like Birmingham. <laughs> There's something you won't hear very often. I actually like. Birmingham. Well, I'm expecting a check from the Birmingham Tourist Board next. <laughs> yeah. so it's just like we've heard you've been saying nice things about Birmingham. They have Peaky Blinders. But <laughs> you, did you know that Birmingham is <clears throat> the fastest growing tourist destination in Europe before COVID? Purely because of Peaky Blinders. I did not know that. <laughs> yes, it's quite remarkable. Because the Peaky Blinders were an actual gang, but n not quite as the TV show presents them. But uh, yeah, Birmingham, the place where plastic was invented, as I like to tell people. Oh, yeah. And on that note, <laughs> please join us again next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers.